The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. Governor Rauner tones down his rhetoric and talks about compromise, but some Democrats are skeptical. Will the two sides finally hammer out a budget? Health care reform is now two years old. Is it an anniversary to celebrate? And a new study says an alarming number of young minorities in Chicago are unemployed and or out of school. How do we get them back on track? Stay with us for those trending stories and more tonight on In The Loop. Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Robinson. President Obama's signature accomplishment, the Affordable Care Act, is undergoing some big changes in Chicago and around the country, including stiff new fines for employers that don't offer coverage for their workers. Here's Chris Burry with more. Thanks, Robin. The deadline is fast approaching for Illinois residents to sign up for health care at the end of this month. The good news, many more people are insured than ever before. The bad news, in many cases, health insurance is costing a lot more than it did last year. And those rising health care costs, combined with new paperwork requirements, lead the list of concerns for Chicago area companies. My great-great-grandfather started the company back in 1885. Andrew Creters is the president of C. Creters & Company in suburban Wooddale. The company's claim to fame is inventing the popcorn machine you see in movie theaters. It also makes other snack food machines. Nacho chip warmers, um, nacho cheese dispensers, cotton candy machines, snow cone machines, all that kind of fun food type equipment. The company employs more than 100 people, which means it must comply with a new rule under the Affordable Care Act. Beginning this year, small businesses with 50 or more workers must provide health care insurance for employees. Even before the new law, the snack machine company did offer health insurance. So Marvin's been with us for more than 20 years. How many years, Marvin? 31 has some change. 31. I'll be 32 this year. There you go. And when those requirements came out, we met those, we met those requirements without a problem. So I wasn't, I wasn't concerned. And while Creter says he supports the basic concept of the Affordable Care Act, he says his company's premiums for health insurance have shot up as much as 25 percent, and the new requirements have tangled his company in red tape. At least for us as a company providing insurance, there's a lot more requirements now for documentation and record keeping, and that, that has greatly increased with, with Obamacare. The penalty for not complying can really add up. $2,000 per employee. In the statement, the Illinois Manufacturers Association said the government is imposing harsh penalties that make it more difficult for manufacturers to operate. Illinois has more than 200,000 small businesses. Before the new law, only about a third of them offered health insurance to their employees. The Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce reports that 78 percent of small business owners had concerns about the rising cost of health care but more Illinois residents than ever are getting coverage. I'm Yuri Sardra. I'm Chris Stolte. And I'm Dave Eigenberg. Every day we're faced with unexpected challenges. And they're not always easy to handle, especially if it's a health issue and you don't have health insurance. Commercials like this one from Get Covered Illinois are trying to persuade young, healthy people to sign up for health insurance. That lowers the overall cost of health care for everyone. Nearly half of the uninsured are between 18 and 34. Brian Gorman with Get Covered Illinois says they've seen a steady stream of people enrolling as the deadline approaches. Since uh, 2013, we've seen uh, nearly a million people across the state of Illinois have received coverage as a result of the passage of the Affordable Care Act and its implementation here in, in the state. One of them is 62-year-old Will Wilson. He was featured on In the Loop more than two years ago when the health insurance plan first started. Wilson is HIV positive. The medications that keep him alive cost $3,200 a month. Before the Affordable Care Act, he could not get insurance. And I never want to go back to what it was like before January 1st, 2014. I am truly, truly grateful for what we have.
The new law has provided other benefits to people such as Dan Mativier, who builds furniture in the basement of his Humboldt Park home. He says the portability of health insurance under the Affordable Care Act gave him the freedom to start his own business. Now I have the ability to run my business in the manner I see fit, have the people uh, work for me that I want to have work for me, and to work for the kind of clientele that I want to work for. And I didn't have those opportunities before. Dan's wife, Rose, says the new health insurance has allowed her to start her own private practice as a therapist. Despite a jump in their premiums from $500 to $650 a month, Rose says it's still worthwhile for them. I still think that health care shouldn't be something that bankrupts you or is something that uh, if you can't afford, then you don't have the ability to pay for something that might be life-saving. Affordability was one of the biggest selling points of the new law. But Dr. Dan Ivankovich, a Chicago orthopedic surgeon for 20 years, says there are hidden costs in the new insurance plans. I had to cancel cases where patients are in the holding area and the hospital say, look, you have an $8,000 deductible, we need that check today. The Affordable Care Act offering insurance plans for all was supposed to keep the uninsured from filling up hospital emergency rooms. But a survey by the American College of Emergency Physicians found that ER visits have actually increased in the past two years. There are now too many patients that are in the system. There are not enough primary care providers. There's not enough specialists. And in the end, that's creating wait lists, which, which equals rationed health care. Dr. Ivankovic says it now takes longer to get procedures approved and there's more paperwork. He says even his own health insurance has gone up about 30%. I think the restructuring is definitely needed. I think the way it is currently is probably unsustainable. If, if premiums continue to go up 30 and 40 percent a year, that's, that's a doomsday scenario. Joining me is Kristen Schorsch, healthcare reporter for Crane Chicago Business, and welcome. Thank Common you. refrain that we heard in that segment, including from the doctor, is that these premiums are going up. He called it a doomsday scenario. Why are the costs going up so much? Right. So when the Affordable Care Act was created and the exchanges were born out of that, um, it was meant to create competition so that the price of insurance would actually go down. But nobody knew who would sign up for these plans, and a lot of people who were either sick or had put off a lot of health care, elective surgeries, perhaps a transplant, um, really expensive people sign up for plans. And so insurance companies are paying out a lot of expensive claims. So and it's more so, expensive than they thought? At yeah, the, it's at, more expensive than they thought, so then the price of health insurance continues to go up. And is it going to continue to go up, the doomsday scenario we heard about? You know, I think it just depends. Now we're in the third year of the exchange, so if we start to see that people are not using the ER as much, that they're actually getting regular doctor visits, eventually people hope that that cost curve will bend and that we'll actually see some price decreases. But I think it's going to take a little time to figure that out. You mentioned the emergency rooms. The Affordable Care Act was supposed to keep people out of the emergency rooms, but we heard in the survey that, in fact, they're as crowded as ever. Right. I think it still takes a while for people to get that message. You know, you have a lot of people who haven't used health care before. So if they're used to going to the ER, they're going to keep doing that until they, they learn and talk with more doctors about, well, how do I stay healthy? And so doctors and hospitals are focusing on preventative care. So they're really trying to, uh, you know, get that message home to people. I guess the difference is that a lot of the people who are going to ERs now do have insurance. That's true. So hospitals and doctors that were doing a lot of free care before, they're now finally getting care or paid for the care that they provide. So that's a good thing for the hospitals and the doctors. What does that mean for a big hospital here in Chicago like Stroger, which historically has cared for many poor people? Right. Stroger used to have a really large amount, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of free care that they provide. And they still do uh, you know, treat a lot of people for free. But that number has drastically decreased because they've gotten a lot more people on Medicaid. Um, they have a really innovative Medicaid program um, through the Affordable Care Act that they were able to get. So that's really helped them. We've heard that the fines uh, are going up. Why is the, the government getting tough now, both for individuals and for the, the business owners? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, because health insurance is not required. So you're going to start to see that in your tax bill. If you don't sign up for health insurance, you're going to have to pay a fine. And so, I mean, the whole point is so that people start um, going to the doctor, not using the ER, so that the price decreases overall for health care. What about for small businesses? Do they have to make a calculation? I mean, is it better for me to go ahead and pay the fine rather than 
get all my workers signed up. You know, it's a complicated formula, you know, to, to figure out like how much your business will end up paying. Um, starting this year in 2016, businesses with at least 50 employees do have to provide health insurance. Um, but I think, you know, we've done a couple of surveys at Cranes. I've read a lot of national surveys and report on this. So a lot of small businesses, even though they don't have to provide insurance, those under 50 employees, they really see it as a perk that's really necessary because otherwise those workers are going to go to companies that have great health insurance packages. So they see it as recruitment and retention. Here in Illinois, there was uh, an exchange just for small businesses mm -hmm. announced. You wrote in uh, Crane Chicago Business that it was a flop. Yes. What, what happened? Well, it really didn't um, have a lot of competition. In the Chicago area, there were only two insurers selling plans for small businesses. Um, a, there was really no messaging, no promotion of it. A lot of small businesses find it really confusing. So, and because the prices weren't that different, um, small businesses stuck with their traditional brokers who could really do the math and the homework for them. So really there were a lot of things stacked against the, the shop exchange is what it's called. So what was left for the small businesses? What was the fallout from that? So the fallout was really that barely any small businesses signed up for it and they just stuck with their brokers. And so unless that exchange really gets robust competition, unless you actually get more insurance companies to compete on it for your business, businesses are just going to stick with their brokers. We heard from the owner of the popcorn machine uh, maker that one of the problems he, he's got, even though he supports the concept of Obamacare, is that the, the paperwork for him has become uh, prohibitive. Is that something that you're hearing and you're reporting from other small businesses? Mm -hmm. Well, I think originally when they were doing the shop exchange, right, it was paper and pen. It wasn't even online. That got delayed. So now that it is finally getting That's hard online, to believe in 2016. Right. <laughs> and so now that it is finally going online, I think small businesses might explore it more. Also, there was this thing called employee choice. The idea was that if you're a small business, you can go and pick, you can give your employees money to go on the exchange and pick from a variety of plans. Normally at your workplace, you only get maybe, you know, one insurer and then a PPO or an HMO to choose from. So this was to have more choice, but it didn't start out like that in Illinois. And so that employee choice aspect is actually starting up. Um, I believe it started up last month or so, but um, so that should help maybe get small businesses to look at it and consider it. We've been seeing all these TV ads in Illinois encouraging especially young people to sign up by the deadline. Why is that so important for the overall success of the program? Mm -hmm. Well, you want to balance out the exchange with not just sick people and older people, but young, healthy people. They're called the young invincibles. So if you really want the cost to balance out and be less expensive overall, you need those, those healthy people, those younger people who don't use health care as much to sign up for plans. They've really focused on that age group. Is the, is the greatest accomplishment for all the downside to the program is the greatest accomplishment here in Illinois that about a million people have health care that didn't have it before. Yeah, and I mean, I think some of the big perks, I mean, the fact that if you have a pre-existing condition, if you're pregnant, if you have diabetes, now you can get health insurance as before you might have been discriminated against and you couldn't get it. Um, you had featured a person who had HIV. Maybe that person before couldn't get health insurance. So there are a lot of perks. I mean, it's, it's a challenge, but I think that it all... Um, you know, you have to weigh the good and the bad. On that note, we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Kristen Schorsch. The governor asks for mutual respect and a familiar face returns to the Chicago Police Department. Here's Robin with a look at these stories. Thank you, Chris. And we are joined this evening by Sherry Runner, president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League. Also, Carl West, president of MG Media, publisher of TBT News Service. And Joseph Morris, attorney for Morris and De La Rosa and the national director of the American Conservative Union. Thank you all for joining us. Thank Speaking you. of the union, the Thank State you. of the Union address, usually part pep talk, part reality check. On Wednesday, Governor Rauner sounded more conciliatory, according to most people. Uh, Sherry, did you hear anything in there that impacts the people that you're most concerned about? Yeah, I think the most important thing that he said is that if they don't do something, uh, that there are going to be parts of the state that die and, and there's going to be no place for people to sue and no place for, for unions to strike. And I think overall, generally, that's true of the individuals that we serve, too. They're going to be uh, start to wither away and move away. As we've seen, demographically, African Americans are moving away from Illinois. Well, I think he meant if we don't do something about my reform agenda, would, would, would you agree? Um, Carl West, do most people understand, you think, what his reform agenda is, and do they take a side? I don't think he's explained it. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a very tricky situation, and he knows that he 
is in a tough spot, but uh, of course people are taking sides. I mean, we all are taking sides because so many people are affected by what he has not done. So with whatever limited information we may have about what he would like to do, uh, Joe Moore, I know you were listening with great interest. You know you've been uh, you know, staunchly involved in the Republican Party for many years, both in the local and national level. Uh, let's take a listen first. I'd like you to comment on kind of the tone that Governor Rauner took. Here is uh, part of his State of the State speech from Wednesday night. If each of us commits to serious negotiation based on mutual respect for our co-equal branches of government, there's not a doubt in my mind we can come together to pass a balanced budget alongside reforms. If we work together, Illinois can be both compassionate and competitive. Not a doubt in his mind. Do you think that he helped remove some of the doubt uh, from other people's minds that, that, that a deal can be reached? Well, in the, in the current political context, he's sending a very interesting message. He spent the last year trying to educate people as to what he understands his responsibility to be as, 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 as a governor coming in facing a hostile supermajority of the opposition party in the General Assembly, uh, following de literally decades of, of leadership in both parties driving this state public sector into the ground and with spillover consequences for the private sector. He's now at a point where, interestingly, the Democrats have not used their supermajorities to override his vetoes of their budgets and their plans. The, the, the door is, appears to be opening to serious negotiations and in just the last week or two, there appear to be very serious discussion underway between Governor Rauner and the President of the State Senate, Senator John Cullerton. But only about the pension issue. There doesn't seem to be any, any, any broad-based well, uh, agreement. The, the public discussion seems to be about the pension issue. Uh, but if there's, if there, if, understanding that the, the pension problem, the deep, deep pension hole that the state of Illinois is in is, is the 800-pound the, the gorilla in the corner of the room that's driving a lot of other conversations. If there's, if there's forward movement in terms of possible compromise, I mean, possible compromise, ways out, ways forward on the pension issue, then there could be possible compromise in the way. Then everything uh, on else other, kind of on may other fall issues. in line. And certainly the, the, what, it, what the governor seemed to be telegraphing was his, his transom is open. He's got conversations going with Senator Cullerton. The odd man out remains Speaker Madigan. There's a desire to open those conversations in a serious way as well. And he did mention the issue of respect as, as if there isn't any. But I think what happens is that people get so caught up in the individual things that they care about being impacted by this. Uh, Carl, the, the threat to Chicago State University, for instance, a historically black college on Chicago's uh, south side, they're saying March 1st they're going to run out of money. Uh, and, you know, then comes the counter narrative, well, you know, you've misspent your money for many years. Uh, why are you in worse shape than other universities? Is that going to be the kind of pressure you think that's going to help move this? Well, contrary to my Republican friend here, I don't recall ever being educated by Rauner to what he's attempting to do has been more so this is how I'm going to do it and you guys need to fall in line with this. Now granted, quickly, I don't think that uh, any one of the parties have been working on behalf of the state of Illinois in any serious manner uh, but uh, I think that now, is, now it comes a time when humanity has to take place and, and be concerned with the people who are being affected which is a Chicago state, for that matter, when you have an institution that is predominantly black and uh, in this in student population, and you're talking about this institution having the chance of closing? I mean, who can even phantom that? Uh, to me, it's mind-boggling. Now, here's what I did learn that I believe that Rauner is going to come around on that. on that. There may be some other things that he, well, of course, he will not because he hasn't. I think Chicago state is going to if you can call the word being saved, it's going to be saved. But quickly, somebody said that even if the money runs out and he doesn't come to life, this institution just won't close that day. They still have to finish out the semester. Uh, so that's, that, that's, no, that's but, no welcome to anybody, of course. I guess but, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as you are about that. <laughs> I think because it's not just Chicago State that's in trouble right now. True. There are, a lot of the state universities are, are in trouble. And if they don't close, their credit rating is looking bad. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, I, and those students that worked really hard to get there who are doing the things that we want them to do to try and find the education that they need to have a career or a job are not going to be able to finish that. That's sending the wrong message, and that doesn't even go along with his purported agenda for a good education. Speaking of young people trying to, I know you have, you, watch, you, you want to, real quick, if you'd like to. Oh, sure. I mean, you've got to get people's attention. You've got to get. But at whose expense? People, the, people, people, the real, real life people have to be upset. Well, real life people, voters have to be upset and say, 
This stalemate is costing me, and the result of the stalemate is 30 or more years of really bad government in the state. The way the state does business has to change across the board, and that message has to be sent to every senator and every representative of both parties from the top of the state to the bottom of the state. Our attention well, has been got. Okay, you can believe that. And, and I think that governance is different from business. Yeah. Unfortunately, the governor's background is in mergers and acquisitions, and this is the way you do business in that sector. But to be a governor, you are and for the people. And I don't understand how you can sit by and let people suffer. Even if you need to get their attention, there's a way to pass a budget and then solve these problems. Let's, if he's, if he's, let's bring one other subject into well, this in, the, in the terms suffer, of people sorry, suffering. The, the, the suffering, the suffering is not, a, a, hasn't been made just this year. Sure. The suffering has been decades in the making. I guess I the people's it, questions may be: Is it the shared ice is coming suffering? Above the surface. <laughs> is, it, right. is everybody suffering, or no. just those who are most dependent on the state? Um, is part of it. And speaking of people suffering and trying to get students to be, stay in school so they can get jobs after. Apparently, uh, there are no jobs to be had if you are young, male, and black or brown in Chicago. The Urban League mm -hmm. and the University of Chicago just came out with a, a, its yearly um, data on teen mm -hmm. unemployment. It is shocking. It is shocking. Um, we do an annual uh, 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 forum with the Alter Alternative Schools Network. Mm -hmm. And this year, uh, the University of Illinois Great Cities, Greater Cities Initiative did the, uh, the statistics. And it found that we have uh, among the highest in the nation of disengaged youth. That means they're out of work and out of school. 47% of African American males in the city of Chicago are out of work and out of school. That's and, ridiculous. And I did say you, you of C, it is you I C, which right. <laughs> uh, not that they're in competition with each other, <laughs> not, right. not much. Different. Yeah, but they are, but they are different. So you know, 88% of teenagers, 16 to 19 year old black males. Mm -hmm out of school, out of work. What does that translate to? Uh, more and more poverty. And what is... M more and more poverty, more dysfunction, more chaos, and let's just be serious about this, more crime. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. And, and, and it, what's shocking about it is that the, the rates of unemployment, not just for African Americans, but certainly for African Americans, also for Latino youngsters, white youngsters, perhaps the highest category of unemployment that the study shows is among Afri uh, Latino, uh, Latinas, Latinas. Uh, Lat Latin, Latin females in the teenage bracket, uh, is uh, higher than uh, elsewhere in the United States. It's higher than the national average. It's higher than New York. It's higher than Los Angeles. It's higher than the rest of the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. and, but, and having a job at that age is, is said to be very important. And you talked about everybody's kind of bad off, but the disparity. Uh, but you talked about, you know, white teenagers compared to uh, black male teenagers. Is there a disparity or is just everybody... No, there is a disparity, and Chicago is a historically very segregated city, and we find these pockets of high unemployment on the, in the south and west sides in the neighborhoods that are traditionally majority African American. Same neighborhoods where we find the crime. Two years ago, the University of Chicago did do a study of those kids who spent eight weeks in their summer jobs program. The crime among those youth that had the eight weeks of summer employment versus those that didn't have any employment was 43% less. And it lasted for 18 months, that effect of having a job and knowing that there was a different way. And, and well, I, the, the, a lesson that has to be driven home here is that people are leaving Illinois, including employers are leaving Illinois and, 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 and leaving Chicago at higher rates because of a climate of high regulation, high taxes that makes life unhappy for, 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 so, for, for employers. And the people who suffer are not rich employers. They can go to Indiana, they can go to Iowa, they can go to Wisconsin, Texas, and, and North Carolina, as the data show they do. The people who suffer from bad policies of taxation, regulation, and the like are the are working people, the poor people of the, of the inner city. The question for me is, are we looking at a situation where we try diligently to fix this? Or we just have to accept the reality of what it is. Or find out who to blame, and, and, right. and that makes well, us feel better. Well, why, exactly. why don't we, why don't we re um, examine where our resources are being invested? I mean, all of those rich companies could absolutely help solve this jobs problem by making sure that they invest in these communities for jobs. Well, and but the these rich companies are not, uh, they're not charities. They're in business to make profits, as they ought to be, because, because it, they have to make profits in order to supply jobs, jobs being up far and away the best welfare programs ever. <laughs> what, what the state can do is not force them to become charities. What the state can do is create a tax and regulatory environment that makes them want to okay. open we, we have We've, we've, in, in we've visited that point, but, and I, do, I, I hear what you're saying. They are not charities, but without a consumer base that's able to purchase them because no one has any money, you kind, of, you kind of mess up the cycle. And I think your report almost begs the question if police reform should be our number one priority or if it starts before that. Right. Chicago Police Department uh, has been just, it's just been on fire lately. We did get a new police, not superintendent, but 
but a consultant to guide the, as, uh, the, guide the department through these civil rights reforms. Charles Ramsey is not exactly new, but he comes in to the department as a consultant at a time when it seems there is something new every couple of days. Uh, the uh, Quintonia LeGreer case, which was bad enough with the, what the department called an accidental shooting of a woman who was opening the door, to, to, after which he was also killed and she was killed. But then we hear the 911 calls that he made uh, earlier in the evening that no one realized he made until these are released. And these, this is not what you want to hear on the other end of a 911 call, probably. Could you say obviously? Yeah, when you answer the question. There's an emergency. Can you send an officer? Yeah, as soon as you answer these questions. What's your last name? There's an emergency. Okay, if you can't answer the questions, I'm going to hang up. I need the police. Terminate the call. So obviously, you know, you hear the anguish in his voice. Yeah. Um, and then you, and then he's hung up on, and he makes two more calls. When his father finally calls, the police do come and, of course, shoot him dead. He had a baseball bat. Is there a systemic kind of disregard, as some have argued, for, for black lives? There's a job that's open right there mm -hmm. because she should not have that job. Okay. And so someone should have a new job because she shouldn't have that job. Well, the cynicism um, that's evident in that call yeah. and the, the system, you can, you can say it's systemic. I think Charles Ramsey is a good choice. I mean, mm -hmm. I think he should have probably been in Chicago when he was in Washington and in Philadelphia. He was passed over twice. He was passed over out. twice. And so I think it's, I think it's really, really important. Um, I'm a co concerned, especially about this case. You know, the new superintendent, Escalante, said that he was going to release information and put these officers on 30-day administrative leave immediately after these kinds of things happened. We know nothing more about it. We've got a tape released. We don't know who the officer is. We don't know what the circumstances he, he, were. He's the interim superintendent, by and the he way. Should, right. He should be just that, and he should not be around anytime soon. How, how, how big of an issue is this? You're, you're, you're talking about being friendly to business. Is this one of the reasons that the it's businesses huge. are afraid to come to Illinois? It, it is. A, it's, it's an important factor. It's a huge factor. People People are, we have people dying in the streets because of crime, and, and we, now we have a police department that we don't trust. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the police should be somebody you can turn to, and if you can't trust anybody else in the street in a crisis, you ought to be able to trust the police. I, I agree as well that Chief, bringing Chief Ramsey as a consultant is a, is, a, is, a, is a brilliant move. He has a tremendous reputation for the work he's done in other departments, but he also obviously knows the history and the inside culture of this will, department. Will it make Ram, a difference, Ram, Carl? Ramsey is a wet band-aid, right? <laughs> He's, he's just a consultant. He's, he's not but the, he's even look. He's he was looked over twice, so that tells you that they had no love for him back then, and so the love they have for him now is strictly as a showpiece to attempt to placate to Chicagoans who had an affinity for him then. Okay. But it's evident Chicago had no affinity for him in the administrative part. So to bring him in is just like a wet bandaid to me. I mean, like, what is he really going to do? Sherry, let me give you the last word. Hopeful or not? I hate to use the word hopeful, but I am, I am going to continue to work to make change. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank we appreciate you. your insights. Sherry Runner, Carl West, Joseph Morris. And that concludes tonight's show. You are now in the loop. For more information on our program and our guests, log on to WICC.org and link to In the Loop. For Chris Bury, I'm Robin Robinson. We'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>